Hey everybody, it's Laura Kingen, ready for a live demo uh, Wednesday. Uh, today, the title is Hyper Ideas for Home. Uh, welcome, I know there's a lot of new followers. Um, I appreciate that and it's my intention to offer uh, this, this live demo free to you all um, in attempts to um, share with you what I've been studying for 40 or so years. Um, uh, I've been um, welcomed on some of these autism pages and I really appreciate that as an occupational therapist. Please know that uh, I'm learning alongside with you all um, and yet I have some things to offer and I've been surprised at um, uh, how many parent, new parents are asking about how can I address um, my hyperactive child? Um, and then do I use medication or what? Um, it's my intention as an occupational therapist to offer activities. And I'd like to do that with you all today. So um, uh, for those of you that are new, um, especially, let me just explain a little bit. Uh, when I do these live demos, uh, I'll do an introduction and then I like to present a concept or some concepts. And then again, as an occupational therapist, to actually do an activity that you all can do alongside, um, ideally, uh, in your own home. Please be aware this is a free offering. Um, do the, any of my suggestions at your own risk. Uh, please be safe. Um, but hopefully there'll be some ideas here that maybe you have not thought about that might be helpful to you all um, in addressing your child's behavior or children's behavior because I think we all know the term hyperactive or hyper. Um, but are there ways that are maybe non-medication oriented that could be helpful? I mean, granted, sometimes uh, I've seen improvements with medication, um, but I, I'd like to think, certainly as an occupational therapist, there's activities that we can do to help address some of the hyperactivity um, with or without medication. Um, I am a nationally registered occupational therapist. I have been since 1983. Um, I am licensed by the state of Arizona to practice occupational therapy. Um, as a registered occupational therapist, I can evaluate and treat, um, but I do have to be careful within the bounds of the, my state licensure. Having said that, I do feel like I can come from an educational standpoint and offer uh, suggestions just in general. Uh, it's not a treatment plan for anyone in particular, just some general suggestions um, that I feel like I've uh, learned over time. So um, uh, there's other demo or other live demos I have online. Uh, between Facebook and YouTube are my main pages. Maybe eventually I'll put some more onto TikTok. Um, my main area of work has been the sensory arena, especially with autism. But my background has included um, behavioral issues. I used to work at St. Luke's Behavioral has, whoa, St. Luke's Behavioral Health Center in Phoenix, Arizona. I did that for mm, over 12, 13 years, and this was back in the 80s, actually, where we had a sensory integration room. Now I am very careful about using that word sensory integration. Um, I'd rather use the term sensory processing or sensory motor. But we had a great sensory integration room. That's what we called it at the time. Um, that was, well, bef that was back in the 80s, before uh, splits and all. Um, but we worked with the sensory, uh, sensory motor aspects in regards to treating individuals, children with psychiatric issues. And it was amazing how many um, individuals with, sen with psychiatric issues also had the sensory issues and how we can address a lot of the psychiatric issues through the sensory um, modality or sensory arena. Um, so let me progress on to that. Uh, and let me also add, I present these concepts like in a classroom portion and then we go into move into the lab portion. So um, my business, is entitled sense the name of it is sensory solutions inc um uh so our my emphasis is on sensory aspects what are the sensory aspects well you know we think of the five senses um we have the vision we have smell we have taste hearing and touch 
There's more though. And one of the big, um, <coughs> excuse me, one of the big sensory arenas that we work with, especially in regards to autism, is movement, is our vestibular sense. It's right, uh, that portion of our brain that detects vestibular movement, balance input is, is in our inner ear. It's right near where we hear. Vibration is a powerful sense and it's picked up by the vestibular sense. It took me a while to um, shift gears thinking that that was a tactile thing. Well, it's actually about, it's related to vestibular, related to movement. Um, as you can see, uh, there's a drum kit. And I don't know how well you guys can see it on this. I have two iPads, so on this one, it's a little harder to see. Um, but um, I, my husband is a drummer. And so I've asked um, him to join me um, later on in the lab portion uh, where we'll bring in some music. So there's the auditory piece, but I just want to highlight also there's the vestibular sense and that that part of our nervous system that detects this uh, vibration is in our inner ear. How many of you who have autistic children um, who has uh, held a, vi uh, a toy that vibrates um, and has put it right to their nose or to their chin or right here? <laughs> right, Q in the symbols, right? Um, I interpret that, I guess more often than not, as somebody really seeking a lot of vibration. They're trying to get like really direct to the source. I want vibration. <clears throat> the topic of today is hyper ideas for home. So that vestibular movement sense is so powerful and so important for these um, children who are hy hyperactive and hyper isn't necessarily the most uh, appropriate medical term, I guess hyperactivity. Um, it's more like hyper slang. So I think we have to be careful with that, even though I did include that in my title, because I think it captures and encapsulates so much of what a lot of people have to deal with. So as an occupational therapist, I work with the sensory arena. Certainly I would evaluate a child and know their individual likes, dislikes, strengths, weaknesses, and develop a treatment plan. Um, but I think for purposes for this live demo um, and for general education, we can talk about some of these concepts to help teach you as parents and caregivers and guardians, teachers, aides, some ideas so that when you're dealing with a hyperactive child, you may go to more of these natural sensory oriented approaches um, to see if that can help you maybe before. I have to be careful um, because medication can be helpful, um, but I think these strategies can also be helpful. So um, there are two main areas that I want to address um, as an occupational therapist, and that is our sense of touch and our sense of movement. And as you can see right here, I got something hanging in my room. Um, this is the first demo that I'm going to actually talk about swings uh, because, again, movement is so important. I am going to present these to you in a more general way so that you can take these general ideas and then make them unique to your own self and to your circumstance. Like I said, it's really important to be safe. Um, I do have a clinic in Flagstaff, Arizona, but we're still kind of dealing, we're dealing with a lockdown still. And so to be able to do this demo in my own home, welcome, um, but to give you some ideas for your own home. First off, whatever space you have, make sure it's safe. Um, I'm sure with those who have hyper, hyperactive children, it's a huge safety issue. And following some of the discussions, um, there was one thread I was watching in the last 24 hours about the child wanting to climb, doing a lot of climbing and kind of sh shredding their room. And another parent commented, 
they've just put a crash mat on the, the floor of their child's bedroom and have made it kind of like a sensory uh, uh, room that's safer, that can channel their child's needs. And so that's a good, a good illustration of why I wanted to do this demo for you all today is to help you all with those, like those kids that are wanting to climb and move and do things. And, and it's like, I want to go on and on and on and on and to illustrate ah, you know, how that hyperactivity can be a lot. Um, and this, these parents are talking about not being able to fall asleep at night because they're having to make sure that their child is safe. And as an occupational therapist, we come from a, we come from functionality and uh, trying to help improve independent functioning. And if parents are unable to sleep at night because their child's moving all around, how functional is that? So hopefully here's some ideas for you. Um, that'll give you a basis of some ideas that you can um, use in your own home. Um, I know many of you do not have a hammock swing or an apparatus to hang a swing. Um, but I figured for today, I just, I wanted to talk from the swing standpoint to help give you some concepts that you can then, um, uh, apply to your own home situation. Certainly a rocking chair could be something that's helpful. Um, as you can see, there's these exercise balls. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit today too. Uh, that can be an alternative to help give you some of that movement that you may not be able to get from a swing. I think the swing is kind of like the purest form of um, being able to stimulate the inner ear, that vestibular sense. Um, when we talk about autism and sensory processing disorder or sensory integration or sensory motor issues, we're coming from the standpoint that there's something that's going on in the brain. Something has caused some type of brain either anatomical or physiological or something that is interfering with the different structures of the brain to connect and communicate and talk to other structures of the brain um, that is informative to give us some kind of motor response or some kind of response. Um, certainly, and there's a lot of reasons why our brain isn't necessarily functioning quite right. Um, whether there's been some kind of injury. Um, I don't necessarily associate sensory processing disorder with cerebral palsy, but with cerebral palsy, there could be some sensory issues, like for example, certainly vision. Um, the oral motor movements of our mouth, there's motor output movement, but what about the sensory input? Those kinds of things can be affected with um, cerebral palsy but I think the uh, like a big area is in autism and overall developmental delays um, I have no intention to really get in getting into the causes of sensory processing issues in this demo today um, but it sure seems like it's on the increase and um, I hope that some of these ideas will be helpful to you all Trying to think if there's anything else. I think um, when we talk about hyper or hyperactivity, one of the key things is prevention. Doing your best to try to um, manage your environment, your child's routines, day-to-day -day events is I think the best way to handle hyperactive behavior. Easier said than done. And that takes, I think, a lot of education um, and learning to get you to that point, right? Um, excuse me. So prevention is really, really important. But what happens if your child is in the middle of a meltdown? What kinds of things can you do? We'll talk about that. So I think I'd like to segue into the classroom portion, into the lab portion. And I would like to um, show you the swing. And we'll talk a little bit about the balls. And I have taken the cushions off my couch. And I have 
um, created a crash pad play area um, in my living room. So we'll do some active kinds of things. I talk about uh, self-regulation. And I always like to do this. This is just, it's, it's very important when we talk about like autism. Um, also emotional regulation and even just our day-to-day -day functionality. When we wake up or when we start an activity, we kind of start out, we're maybe a little trepidatious, we're not so sure. And as we go, as you can hear in my voice and, and um, my whole arousal level increases as I'm talking. And then we're gonna do some physical, physical, um, uh, busy kinds of things. So we're gonna go start out slow, we're gonna get very busy, we're gonna get very busy, but then we're gonna calm back down. And it's so important, especially when we talk about hyper, to um, look at this concept because how I like to describe it, it's like a cycle um, that, that um, for example, hyperactive child, they start out and then they get busy in, in an activity and then they just are unable to calm themselves back down. And so what happens is they start going and then they, they're off and running. And you got to like, have you ever used the expression, you got to peel your child off the ceiling, um, that they're just, they're crying and sobbing. And I mean, how many horror stories um, have you all gone through? And as an occupational therapist in 40 years or almost 40 years of working, I've heard a lot of those stories. So I sympathize with you all. Um, so it's best to be able to work on that cycle of bringing somebody back down. And that's what my intention is um, certainly in our active lab portion in um, what I like to call our quiet time activity. So we'll do, so, we'll do some busy things and then we'll calm back down. And we're gonna, um, because today is about hyper, hyperactivity and really busy kids, what do you do to help get, ha, I have to be careful of even how I phrase that, how, how do we help facilitate a child to calm back down without having to go into all that meltdown? Um, to be able to utilize some of these principles can be helpful. And whether it's an autistic child or, you know, my own emotional meltdowns, how much can some of these types of principles be helpful to you all? So the last part in our lab portion today will be this quiet time activity where we'll, we'll stop being so like busy and, and I want you to have an actual react, uh, an actual physiological response where you can feel that calming back down. And hopefully you can come back and review this video to be able to um, um, utilize this over and over again, okay? So let's talk a bit about the swing, the ball, the crash pads, quiet time, okay? So let's see. Now, if you're going to use a swing, make sure it's safe. Um, I am not going to show you my how I have this hooked up because um, I want to make sure you all um, utilize this in a good and safe way. I don't want to show you how I've done it. <laughs> because this is just for live demo purposes. Like typically, we think of a hammock swing as where, like say you have two trees and you lie in it. Um, but as occupational therapists, typically what we do is we put the two ends together. Now, let me just adjust this a little bit so you can see this a little bit better. There we go. I um, had a conversation on uh, one of the Facebook threads um, about postural insecurity. Well, one of the things that I would do first off when I'm working with somebody is to determine how high off the ground I want to even bring this swing. Now this, I mean, I would tend to, uh, without getting too much into some of the details, I think this is an important point. Some kids with balance issues don't like their feet up off the ground. I remember years ago working with somebody 
who had trouble getting on to the, stepping onto the school bus. They did not like their feet up off the ground. There's something about needing to be so grounded um, that, I mean, I was thinking of this kid that, um, as opposed to the kids that like to climb, there's other kids that don't want to get their feet up off the ground. They don't like playground equipment. So we need to be, instead of forcing somebody, I want to work with where they're at and then try to move them along developmentally. So this swing, depending on who I'm working with, I may want it very, very low to the ground. Um, and I don't want it so high that they're struggling. Keep in mind also is the safety. I have cushions on the floor. Um, and again, if I were to swing this too far, I'm going to hit some things. So you have to be careful. I want to point these a couple of things out about the swing. Because when we talk about hyper, I think a lot of that is that what is driving that behavior is an individual's need for that type of sensory input. What type of sensory input? A lot of times it's either movement oriented or it's more touch oriented. It's fascinating. We all, I've noticed, we all have a propensity towards the movement or the tactile. Which does your child prefer? Do they like to move? Or is their activity driven either because they're tactilely defensive or they need more tactile input? Um, we worked at St. Luke's Psychiatric Hospital with a lot of aggressive children. Well, one of the ways we would work through that is through touch or deep pressure. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But let's, excuse me, talk about movement. We want to find the just right challenge. It's a buzz term as an occupational therapist. We don't want it too much. We don't want not, uh, not enough. We want to find that just right range. So typical swings, let's see if I do it this way. Typical swings, like on the playground, go back and forth. And kind of lucky, you can go side to side. But that's only stimulating par parts of our that vestibular mechanism. This swing is actually on a bungee cord. And there are some pieces of equipment that you can get that have a bungee cord kind of a um, type of input. I don't think I'm going to be able to do this very well. I want to push this up and down. And I want it, what I'm trying to illustrate is the vestibular sense of up and down, like jumping up and down. And one of my favorite swings is an inner tube swing. So you can like straddle the swing and you can bounce up and down. And that is one of the best ways to incorporate both the vestibular and the tactile touch proprioceptive sense. As well as working on muscle strength and balance and all kinds of fun things. But we don't have that here. But I, I want to point that out that that's one of the options. The other option is big circle. So if you can get a swing apparatus where you can go around in a big circle, keep in mind your arc on how wide you can go. In this room, I can't go very far. So that's why we like to have the swings more in the middle. Now I've got high ceilings. So if, if I could empty out this room, this would be a great room to be able to really get a lot of wide movement. Now, here is a caution. If you've ever watched like America's Funniest video, Home Videos or whatever, and the kids are spinning around and they stop spinning and then they're, they're staggering around the room and their, their eyes are jerking around, it's saying that their brain has too much input and it's taking a while to process that. So here's the word of caution. If you see a lot of that, be really careful and stop 
I would recommend stopping the movement. Now, I share this as an occupational therapist because um, of the safety considerations and yet of the power of this type of sensation. Um, so please be careful. A little, and I'm talking only a couple seconds, it shows, just use your judgment, it shows that that movement is getting um, registered, but it's also a sign to back off, okay? So please be very careful. But why I'm sharing this with you is because for hyperactive children, I think a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times, the child is wanting more movement. And one of the best ways is through the swing. Um, my, my heart goes out to you, parents, who are having trouble sleeping and are spending so much time trying to manage their hyperactive child's behavior, that something simple as like a swing could be incredibly helpful, okay? So let's take it a step further. Some kids really like to spin. So when you have an apparatus like this, you can spin it. Okay, maybe not, the, maybe not, not in my home today, but you get the idea. Some kids really need the spinning and we're gonna take it a step further. Can you get it going around in a big circle and spin? Then go the other way and spin. So if you go in one direction too long, the brain inhibits that information and then it doesn't really have that impact. So we wanna switch it around. And if you watch your child's behavior, it may give you an indication on, um, it should give you an indication, it should be incredibly informative on whether or not um, your child is responsive to that. Never force this. Let your child be the guide. It's like your child knows best, not you, not me. Each individual knows best what they want and need. As an adult, I can help structure my environment to help meet my child's needs. And one of those ways could be with the swing. Now here's another consideration. Can't do this at school. That's another thing I've heard. Well, maybe not. Some schools are really good at incorporating these kinds of things. And I think for kids who are having sensory issues, developmental issues, they may, it may even be built in their IEP to have adaptations like breaks. I know for even us adults, when we get stressed, having breaks is important. And to have kids who are having sensory issues, to have to concentrate for very long periods of time without breaks, I think is, is placing a lot of demands on them. So if we can go ahead and, and have a structured routine that they can get their sensory needs met on a regular basis, it would serve everybody well, should anyway. Because their sensory needs are being met and are being acknowledged. And so we want to try to help satiate and give the, um, give the, these children individuals what their bodies are craving. And it's through their behavior that's communicating, I need more of this. And it's up for us adults to be able to structure it for them um, so that it can help improve their functioning and thus later our functioning. One other thing about the swing And this is oh, about caution. Some kids want to hang upside down. Be incredibly careful with that. I would never introduce that to a child unless they sought it out themselves. Because that, um, that could cause some medical issues. Um, just want to be careful with that. Because there's going to be some kids that are going to want to do that. And I think it's a way we can honor their needs. You know, what about some of you more adept gymnasts? Have you ever like hung upside down on a trapeze swing? Um, 
that's hanging upside down. You don't want to stay there for a really long period of time, okay? So I just wanted to use that word of caution. Um, maybe I, I think I, I'd like to do a, a live demo sometime just on the swings, but let me just mention there are other kinds of swings that we can use. Um, like I mentioned, the trapeze swing. Um, the kid that climbs a lot, there are ladder swings, maybe a ladder swing, whether you have it grounded, have the, the rail, the, usually what I would do is I would stand on the bottom rail and stabilize it and let the child climb up and down, but that may be a judgment call, maybe working on the balance and not step on that so that they really have to like work on the balance. There are some ladder swings where there's three, three different areas that they could, that you can climb. Um, I worked in somebody's home who have several, have several different um, swing hooks. And you can get very creative um, in different swings. We would have an inner tube swing on one, the hammock on another, and the spandex swing in between, and there's all kinds of climbing that could be done. Why would you do something like that? Some kids need that much input. And so not only are they getting the vestibular movement, but that climbing is working on that upper extremity strength. Um, it's working on the reciprocal, bilateral motor coordination. There could be some um, eye-hand, visual perceptual uh, components involved. So there's a lot of fun things you can do. But it's very gross motor oriented um, with the intent of trying to satiate that individual's needs. So let's talk about this for a moment. So what I was just talking about, the swing, we can apply to the ball as well. So there is the back and forth movement that you can get. There's the side to side movement you can get. You can do different positioning. There's the up and down. There's also the rotational movement. This is a little big for me. This is gonna be a little small. Let's see if I can illustrate this. So going around in a big circle. So with the ball, you can get this different type of movement, but what the ball adds is also the tactile, the deep pressure input. So, it's important to know, let's see, I'll do it this way. It's important to know if you're dealing with um, your child or someone you're caring for, what sensory system they respond to better. The movement, the touch, or is both best? and work with that. Um, a couple other comments that I, I should have said earlier, but when we talk about the five senses, is when we talk about hyperactivity, what else is going on in the environment from a sensory standpoint that is impacting the hyperactive behavior? Like for example, in this iPad, in this video, there's this light, and as I'm talking, Forgive me, it's actually a little annoying, isn't it? So how much is something like that contributing to overstimulation? Now, I'm functional enough, I'll be able to inhibit and handle that type of stimuli. But what happens, and I feel like my brain is pretty well organized, but what happens if it's a young child who um, has some sensory processing issues? There's that, and there might be the clothes that's bothering them, and there's noise, and somebody's banging outside. All those different elements contribute to that hyperactivity. So as an adult, it's up to us to monitor the environment for our children to help them. 
in order to help manage that hyperactive behavior. So take into consideration things like the lighting, the sounds, the smells, maybe not so much the taste, but um, that's certainly a consideration. One of the thread conversations um, on Facebook is trying to problem solve, you know, some of the, some of the reasons of why their child is all of a sudden not doing something. Well, they changed the smell, they changed the shampoo. Just that simple change. First of all, it's change. But are you, we need to take into consideration the fact that that smell um, can, can either make it or break it, can either be something that the individual likes or not so much. I just recently got some new conditioner and it smells like Hawaii and it, it, it brings up some nice memories for me and fondness, but it's a really strong smell. And especially a child who's nonverbal, they're not gonna be able to say, I don't like that smell. So these are some really simple kinds of things that can go a long way. If your child is hyper, Look from a sensory standpoint what's going on and see if you can problem solve some ideas to maybe help reduce that behavior. Whether, it, whether it's too much vision, uh, too much sound, like cafeterias a lot of time, that smell, people can either like it or not and that can work on our arousal level or our energy level. Um, With regards to touch, and I'm just gonna wrap this up, but I do wanna say a little bit about touch. There's two types of that touch. It's a, a deep pressure, like with a ball or, or a massage, jumping and pounding is deep pressure. Um, weighted equipment gives deep pressure. Most people respond um, in, in, to that type of input as calming. But there are, I would say about 15% are actually, actually calm with a lighter touch. You know, like that gentle stroking. For most people, this has a tendency to be kind of alertatory and kind of waking people up as a po um, so this um, for a lot of people isn't going to be calming. It's going to have the tendency to kind of add to that hyperactivity. You know, like an example of, some, of a child walking um, uh, in line in school to the cafeteria and somebody bumps up to them or something like that and then they turn around and their natural response is to hit them and then it's labeled as a behavior. Well, how much of that child really is tactically defensive and has some sensory processing issues? that is physiological in nature because we're dealing with the brain. We're dealing with issues that are impacting the brain. A lot of different things can impact our brain and how well it's functioning. Um, so it's a huge reason why we use the ball and crash pads and, and medicine balls and weighted vests because we're trying to impact our sense of touch through deep pressure. So, um, I've done a lot of talking today. Um, figured I probably would. <laughs> I usually do. <laughs> but I would like to do uh, some quiet time. I have my husband standing by at the drum kit. So, uh, let me just explain a little bit. Let's take, take about five minutes. Where I, I want the music to help kind of encapsulate what it's like to be kind of hyper, or to be busy, or to have a lot going on. And how do we get out of that like really hyper state? And we're gonna go, we're gonna plop. And just let it ride for a little bit. I've asked my husband to use the symbols to let it ride. And we're gonna try it again. We're gonna get up, and let's be busy, and we're gonna let a lot of music. and. You can use the balls, and if you want to use the swing or some kind of movement or your crash pads, and be busy, and then we're going to plop. <sighs> the symbols just carry us. So what I'm trying to facilitate is going from that hyper place 
to come, to let the physiology of our systems as we participate in this activity, to be busy and then to calm down. To be busy and then calm down. And we'll wrap up this live demo in a calmer place. And at that point, I'll, I, I won't talk much more. Um, and we'll just wrap that up, okay? So make sure you're safe, be safe, and may this be helpful to you all, okay? Let your body be your guide. One of the terms is interoception, tuning into our own selves. Let our bodies guide us through this activity, okay? So cue the music. Go ahead and just kind of let it rock out. <laughs> let it rip a little bit as though we're kind of hyper. Let's do it one more time and then 
when we pop, we'll stay a little bit longer. And then we'll wrap up this demo. So, one more time, cue the music. <laughs> open or eyes closed. Okay, let the sound of the symbols just ride it. I'm going to adjust We're letting our breathing guide us to a calmer place. Our sense of touch through the crash pads, the cushions, is offering that tactile input that is also calming. Using calmer sound, like steering into the curve, through the curve. So I hope this has been helpful to you all. Taking another slow, deep breath in and out. You can wiggle your fingers and your toes. Make sure you clean up when you're done. Take good care. Have a good day. Thank you all.